So last time we had a species summary, we looked at an eagle on stilts that likes to practice kickboxing. But the secretary bird wasn't the only animal that got a literal leg up in evolution. Look, I'm allowed to make one bad pun per episode. This one just happened to be the opener. Deal with it. There are many leggy birds out there, but no other mammal rocks outrageously disproportionate legs quite like the maned wolf. Hello, animal lovers. Welcome to the Zoology Girl channel and to another episode of the series Species Summary. I am your host, Strabebe, and today we'll take a look at the unusual gangly doggo that is the maned wolf and maybe find out how they are so different from the rest of the canine family. Let's get started, shall we? So our little doggo friend here is a mammal, as all doggos are, and thus belongs in the class Mammalia. Its infraclass is Eutheria, as it is a placental mammal that gives birth to fully developed young that don't need to live in a pouch for a few months. It then falls into the clades of Boreutheria and Lorisotheria, just like our friend the harp seal in the first episode. For those that haven't watched that episode yet or are just tuning in, this means that it belongs to a specific line of mammals that evolved and developed in the area that became today's northeastern hemisphere during the Cretaceous period. Its order is Carnivora, as you can tell from the carnassial pair and its molars. The carnivora line then divides into two lines, feliforms, or animals with closer relatedness to cats, and caniforms, those that have a closer relatedness to dogs. And given that I repeatedly referred to it as a doggo, I think you can figure out its suborder is caniforms. Likewise, you can guess that its family is canidae, the family of our favorite dogs and dog-like animals, including foxes, wolves, and coyotes. Instead of canis for a genus, however, or even vulpus like some other canines, this animal has its own genus, chrysocyon, because it's actually not very closely related to other their canines, foxes and wolves included, at all. It's the last remaining member of a line that split off from all other members of Canidae a long time ago. Finally, its species name is Brachiurus. The maned wolf is native to South America and is the largest canine to live there, standing at roughly one meter or a little over three feet tall. Many have described it as a fox on stilts, it is by far the most odd member of the canine family, not only because of its legginess, but also because of several other interesting aspects of its biology. For instance, canids, while not obligate carnivores, are at least primarily carnivores. Their diet mostly consists of meat, and it's where they get what they need to survive, but their bodies can process veggies a little bit and get some nutrition from it. That being said, they can't survive entirely off of plant matter, and you should never feed your dog an all-veggie diet. Anyways, back on topic, the main wolf, however, is not a carnivore, but an omnivore, meaning its body can process things like fruits and veggies way better than carnivores can. Its carnassial pair and incisors are much weaker than its carnivorous cousins, as when it does eat meat, the largest thing it goes for is an armadillo. Another unique feature is its rank stench. Like many other animals, it marks its territory with urine, fecal matter, and musk. And the maned wolf's stench is particularly powerful, as its other name, the skunk wolf, reflects. If its goal was to keep things away, that would certainly do it. These animals are pretty lean for their size, only weighing 44 to 50 pounds on average. This is because, like our friend the secretary bird, it's mostly leg. Also, like the secretary bird, it uses those long legs to look over the tall grass in its habitat. They mature at about two years of age and live for about 13 years in the wild and 15 in captivity. These animals usually have between two and three pups, but can have up to five in total. Another fairly unique aspect of the maned wolf is it is not a very social species. This is not entirely unique among canines, as foxes and coyotes often hunt and live alone. However, it is one of the few that do live mostly solitary lives, and it is probably one of the more extreme cases, as outside of breeding seasons, there are rarely positive interactions between unrelated individuals. 
Even in the case of related individuals, this usually is only when a mother is caring for her pups or siblings are being housed together in captivity. Even in these cases, if adult siblings are separated for long periods of time, there is a high chance they will act aggressively towards each other if reintroduced and will form strict territories. Meanwhile, with foxes, forming colonies can happen if resources are plentiful, but there are many individuals. The Maine wolf is also notoriously shy towards humans, as are many wild animals, but its timid nature certainly contrasts with its name of wolf. During breeding seasons, these animals are monogamous, but are only facultatively so. This means that they will only really pair with each other for one breeding season. Afterwards, those animals may never see each other again and will most likely move on to other partners for the next season. Females will look after pups and will wean them within a year. Since they are mostly solitary, they are also pretty quiet animals, but they do have their own forms of communication. They have three types of vocal communication, including whining, growling, and a roar bark. <laughs> They can perk up their fur on the back of their necks to show aggression, along with other forms of body language, and as previously stated, use their stench to tell each other who is living where. A final few behaviors to note include hunting. They're mostly nocturnal and hunt like foxes, stalking and pouncing on their prey. They also use a pacing gait to reduce noise and conserve energy while walking, meaning one side of their body moves all together. The earliest fossils of this species have been found from the late Pleistocene, and genetic testing reveals that its closest relatives are the now extinct Falkland Islands wolf and pseudofoxes. In some South American native groups, the animal is used in some traditional remedies, most notably that its eyes are seen as good luck charms. Despite providing some benefits to farmers by hunting pests such as mice, it itself is seen as a pest due to its habit of stealing chickens and small livestock. Lieutenant Colonel Charles Hamilton Smith, while not the man to discover the animal, was the one to give it its own genus, Chrysocyon, or golden dog, for its russet coat. The Maine wolf began to decline as deforestation across South America began, as well as from issues such as being attacked by domestic dogs or receiving foreign diseases from them. With the introduction of automobiles in the 20th century, their nocturnal habits made them a common casualty on the highways of South America. Today, the animal is considered vulnerable, but there's a good deal of hope for them, as they are listed as a protected species in Brazil and zoos have begun breeding programs. However, nutritional deficiencies Deficiencies are common issues in captive populations since they first started breeding them. As the dog's unique diet and dependency on several plants for natural cures for health issues have made it harder to take care of them than other canines. But dietary research continues and it is constantly improving to give these animals the best possible care and captivity that they can have. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, please consider subscribing and or supporting me on Patreon. If you want to join a community dedicated to studying different sciences and and other areas of learning, then consider joining the Discord study group Study Q&T, which will be linked in the description below. But most importantly, have a wonderful day.